Hey, good morning, everyone. We'll give everybody a few minutes to slowly trickle in and then we'll get started. All right, I think we can go ahead and kick things off. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep, we do. Okay. Uh, so good morning. Um, apologies for being away a little bit. I was fulfilling my Army Reserve duty. Um, been playing a little bit of catch up. So doesn't look like there's a ton that's been added to the agenda. Um, I added one thing, but just to start, um, just so everybody's tracking, this Sunday is July 4th, so um, we're canceling next Monday's call just because the majority of um, participants in the U.S. are going to be on a long holiday for that weekend and um, observance of Independence Day. And then same thing for the tug. It's going to be pushed out to August 2nd. Everybody's tracking the KubeCon and ONES are coming up. So, um, if anybody has anything they want to add to the agenda, we can dive into um, the glossary and the discussion. Um, I don't know how far we made it on the glossary while I was out, but if we think that that one's going to continue to be a big time sink, maybe we look at um, discussion 177 first. Um, I think it's a good way for our community to interface with the rest of the CNCF. Um, they were looking for some help. This is one of the ones that Adam specifically mentioned that the glossary team could use some help on is um, providing just a succinct high level definition of what a CNI is from the context of network people. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that or if we'd rather start with the glossary.
maybe we haven't gotten to our Monday morning coffee yet. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add agenda items or you can just drop them right in the meeting notes, which is in Zoom? All right, I, I guess I'm a little confused as to why a uh, definition of CNI would need our feedback. This is just a, uh, an aspect of how Kubernetes works. And I'm of the mindset that we just regurgitate that definition. Um, I don't know. It's just supposed to be readable, right? Like we got the overview on what the glossary is aiming to achieve. Um, so we could do something else. It's just one of the things that they asked us about. So it, because it's, in my opinion, a pretty well-defined thing, it shouldn't be that hard for the CNF working group to put in a PR and contribute to the CNCF glossary. Could you show it on screen again? Yes. Uh, Tal, what they're trying to do is um, make all of the CNCF glossary start with um, definitions and, and the terminology that's accessible for people that aren't even familiar with cloud native right. yeah, yeah. networking or anything. So it would be help with that, like just bring it up as high as, I think they said like, explain this to a five-year-old type of thing um, or a third grader or whatever the, the, the terminology is. So explain it like that and then go up. And then the otherwise is just making sure whatever goes in there is aligned with Kubernetes and communicate something about networking. Additionally, um, Tal, um, I, I think the parts that we can help with is this right here. I mean, I don't know how many people messed around with um, Kate's before, you know, the CNI was drafted and the lack of uniformity, but I mean, this little bit of color commentary and the problem it addresses and how it helps, I think is something where we could throw our opinions in as network people, but I don't like to your point though, I don't think we're necessarily trying to come up with a definition for a CNI. We're just trying to make it relatable as um, Taylor said. Well, I, I guess uh, if they do want feedback, it's for that second sentence. Um, it takes care of the basic setup. Well, it takes care of the setup. I'm not sure basic is the right word here. It could be very, very complex. Um, and the other part, host network interfaces. Well, it could. <laughs> it could do other things as well, which have nothing to do with the host network interfaces. It, it, yeah, th there's a problem here in the sense of there's what the CNI should do and what the CNI could do. Right, you can make it do literally anything. What it should do, what it's defined to do, what it's documented to do is a slightly different. Well, uh, of course, right? But I, but even in terms of CNI plugins that we we work with a lot, um, I'm not sure this definition is uh, comprehensive enough. It's it's a bit odd to me. The host network interfaces. Well, that's. You know, a lot, a lot of these plugins work with SDN and, and SDN configuration and um, host network interfaces is not the, not the core issue that it, it's not their main, their role is not what is described here, I feel. Yeah, you could view that in terms of how they get it done and what the end result is, because the end result is a container has a network interface that works. The, the means right. to do that is often a lot more complex. Right. So if, I don't if they think want that our they're feedback, necessarily I looking. Feedback. Yeah, but I, I think we could eventually like add like links to other stuff we provide. But like at the end of the day, it provides connectivity from the pods to the rest of the network, right? I mean, we should be more like eloquent than that. But like, I don't think we're necessarily for this definition. You know, we don't need to get into the ins and outs of like what a bird implementation for BGP connectivity looks like in a CNI, right? Sure, I, I'm just saying that the second sentence just seems wrong. Even if we're not getting into it, um, I would remove the word basic. And as Ian said, you know, it's about setting network interfaces in pods. The, this part about host network interfaces, I think should be removed. Uh, if I may add uh, uh, one more perspective, I, I also agree that we shouldn't make this as complex as like that's 
seems simple enough, but uh, in the service mesh world, we use it, the CNI, the fact that uh, you can chain load CNIs and they're executed in a privileged mode. We use it as a way to actually do, you know, IP tables and whatever, which is not necessarily setting up interfaces. It's just, you know, doing networking stuff. The, the crucial point here is that this is run in a privileged mode. Like this thing can do a lot of things that you would avoid to do on the, on the higher levels. Just, I don't know, it doesn't make sense, but yeah. So I, I would take this from what someone was saying earlier, explain like I'm five, right? We're looking for something which is trivial in terms of an explanation using short words that ideally we don't have to contradict in the future when we're explaining to them like they're a grown up. Yeah, I, I'm Ian, I think the way you put it before was uh, best, you know, it, it takes care of setting up pod network interfaces. That's it. <laughs> hey, I, this is Sheetal Joshi from AWS. I'm a developer advocate for EKS team here. Uh, I joined in a little bit late, but I have my basic question. I think I am actually working on the telecom space currently and the CNI, I think more questions come related to the core delegate CNI versus the multis interfaces, what that CNI should look like and what does the CNI mean for when multiple interfaces are involved? Are we taking it to that level or we are just working to the basic core definition of a CNI itself or the CNI? Container network functions to start with. I just missed the earlier context, so I'm sorry if I missed any of the basic context around this discussion. This one's basic and high level, she tell. Um, okay. I would say that if we don't feel like there's an adequate definition, or if we need, you know, more explanation, it's something that we could put in the CNF working group glossary. Um, but for this, it's like, I think Taylor said, it was like to explain it to me, like I'm five thing. This is for people like executives at your company who know nothing yeah. whatsoever <laughs> about our space. And they just want like the pamphlet mm -hmm. version. And then, like you said, I, I do mm -hmm. think the problem that addresses section and the how it helps section is something that this group is uniquely, because we've felt the pain of dealing with them yeah. and trying to implement them is something that we could add flavor to. Um, so this also, is probably still not good, but. There's also a, a semantic uh, thing here. So it is CNI is not a Kubernetes specification. Uh, CNI is a, is a standalone definition, which it lives under, under either, I think either the Linux Foundation or the CNCF, I'm not sure which. So it's also uh, designed to, for uh, configuring network interfaces in Linux containers. And we, I think we should word it such uh, where we where we're like that, and then we put in such as Kubernetes pods, uh, just just to make it exact, because we, we don't want we we want to make sure that we we're presenting the information properly. Very good point. I'm going to link the specification here in the uh, in the chat for whoever's interested. <laughs> Yeah, and very often there there is inf uh, additional information. So when you run CNI, there Kubernetes will often include uh, additional environment variables, which may be Kubernetes specific. So just from a practical perspective, it is it is common to see sometimes CNIs that will only work in a in a Kubernetes perspective, depending on how that's set up. Uh, but uh, but generally, the the purpose of CNI is to is to be a generic Linux container uh, network interface uh, API. Um, can I ask why is pod capitalized? Because people are watching me type and I make mistakes. <laughs> That's a delightful answer. I can't remember what that law in physics is, but when something is observed, it changes its behaviors. My uh, typing ability drastically falls apart anytime I'm on a shared bridge. Um, and just kind of editing this live, it's not perfect, so we'll continue to massage it. 
How about this? It has been adopted by Kubernetes for uh, creating network interfaces on pods. Do we want to qualify that as well, saying at the at startup time, or leave it more generic? I, and I'm fine with either one. I would leave it generic because there are efforts afoot to actually uh, make them dynamic. You know, it's it's complicated, <laughs> right? Because multis okay, is potentially. Uh, Just to manage container networking would do. Um, I'm okay with TALS just because we are trying to give it like the context for um, this, like the fact that we're, I mean, the con generic container networking, I think is kind of covered in the first one, it's library and specification for networking plugins. This second sentence, I think it gives it a little bit of the flavor of how does Kubernetes leverage it? It puts interfaces into pods. But I'm open to be debated on that. Small typo in Kubernetes, by the way. I need all of you to close your eyes for 15 seconds while I type this. Hello? Hello? Uh, I'm uh, Kishan Abdarouf from uh, from uh, Orange France, and uh, I'm a research and uh, development uh, engineer at Orange Labs. And uh, just for uh, that question, so I don't know if uh, you aim only to uh, to define uh, the CNI for uh, for developers and users, or uh, or you aim, you aim also to uh, to define best practices for uh, using CNI, so and uh, more particularly using uh, multis to uh, to attach multiple uh, uh, interfaces to to the Kubernetes pods. Because I know when using multis, we we are able to uh, to attach interfaces of uh, different types. And uh, each type has uh, its uh, dependencies on uh, may have its uh, it, uh, dependencies on uh, on uh, the worker nodes of the Kubernetes cluster, like uh, for example the the presence of uh, uh, a given interface on uh, the pods. So so uh, it may uh, make uh, network functions. Less uh, adapt adaptable to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, Kubernetes clusters in general. So I don't know if uh, you aim to uh, to define best practices, like for for example using um, additional interfaces uh, only when it is required. For example, because uh, I know it. Uh, it is a little bit uh, more complex than uh, using the default network uh, provided by uh, by uh, Kubernetes and uh, the primary CNI plugin. So. Yeah, I think part of it as well is not just identifying best practices, but there are some very real gaps there as well. So I use SROV as an example. So when you request for SROV, there are multiple ways of getting an SROV interface into your into your system, either through a direct or through a kernel interface. But uh, if all you want is like, hey, I, I need something that connects to a certain SROV, then you're in good shape. But if you need a specific one, such as I need one that goes to a specific network with a specific clause that's been configured by a specific top of rack switch, and, and you needed to align against a certain uh, NUMA, uh, a certain NUMA zone, then these type of questions become much more difficult because the there's there's not a strong topology management story in, in Kubernetes just yet. So I think part of the best practices is is, is identifying not just uh, what can you do, but also what is what is still in development or or where are some of the the gaps there as well. So I. I 
Uh, part of part of the initial goal was also to try to work out what some of these things are, so we can ideally try to work out ways to to fix it. But we also have to be careful because telecom is not the primary purpose of Kubernetes, and we need to be careful not to overcomplicate Kubernetes for the sake of service provider workloads, especially when you consider the, that the total size of telecom is minuscule compared to the overall uh, to the overall uh, whoa, 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 Frederick! Users. I'm big and important. Don't don't oh, yeah, forget I mean, the I completely <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> no, no. no, but uh, but to, to to stay on track, though, I just want yeah. to bring something up because this is not relevant to the contribute um, contribution to the CNF CNCF something. So I didn't catch whose name it was from um, Orange Labs, but those are the types of exact things that we're looking for for us to add into the use cases, which is um. Here you can see that there's a couple that have been committed. And then ultimately these use cases will feed into the best practices, right? So like you could start by um, providing some use cases following the template in here um, on the types of interfaces that you are using to connect to your network and you know, interface with pods. And then from there, we could start you know, building the best practices out of there. Like here's a really bad way of doing SRV in a pod. Here's a good way, et cetera. But um, for now, I just, like you said, um, I don't want to like confuse like the work we're doing versus the work that we're just trying to um, assist the CNCF um, thing. And actually I'll jump over to that real quick. It's just so people can see. I do not know why my right click does not want to play nice today. Um, so for those who weren't here for Adam's presentation, um, the CNCF, you know, it wasn't just our group that complained about the lack of definitions out there in the ecosystem. Um, others also found that when they were writing documentation or trying to explain things, it was kind of hard to describe what a lot of the things we just, you know, use um, offhandedly actually mean. And it was announced in the most recent KubeCon EU that there is an initiative to create a glossary that just has very high level, easy to consume definitions that give you the basic gist of what an API gateway is, for instance, right? And so, you know, what it is you can see here, I mean, we all know that an API gateway is substantially more complex and complicated than what this um, is describing. But, you know, the reality is, is um, most people outside of like this group and, you know, people who really care about like API lifecycle management probably are happy with something like this. And then the parts that I would like us to really quick at least put some footnotes down and then we can jump to the glossary is, um, you know, what does the CNI do? And I don't know, it's not in there, but it's my, some we want to keep track of on our own is like what problems doesn't address, does not address. But, um, you know, there's, I think there's some pretty clear cut examples of what the CNI, you know, helps with. I mean, the fact that I can move from Cilium to Calico to, you know, flannel if I'm kicking it old school or whatever um, and have a reasonable expectation that things are going to work while having completely different network paradigms I think is you know something that that helps with so um, the right and you know multi CNI and yeah. multiplex is the whole thing too so that adds yet another uh, important contribution that CNI does but right this is out of scope for this specific issue I think I lost my little write up. Okay. So thank you for uh, the clear response. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And the stuff that you're addressing, though, is things that this group uniquely cares about. So by all means, please kind of take a peek at the, um, the section for, uh, sorry, lost my stuff, the section for adding use cases and then building best practices off of that. And you could also create a, a new discussion directly if you're not ready to add a use case. If you have a use case, those are um, one of the best ways for us to have a focused discussion. But this discussion area is another place to add. All right. Since I completely lost that other thing like a goof. I don't know why my trackpad's giving me such a hard time today. 
So just real quick at a high level, um, if anybody wants to spitball some problems that the CNI addresses and how it helps, I'll really quick fix this. Okay, I'll put in chat the second sentence you had given me earlier. Uh, all right. Because I don't remember it now. Yeah, and stick the word Linux in front of containers just to differentiate from virtual machine containers or other forms. Actually, maybe we should leave it as containers because there is CNI to to virtual machines now to to some degree, and although they still configure the never game space at the end of the day. So, I think I think. Uh... Yes, network plugins can uh, can be used for uh, virtual machines, but uh, I think uh, the CNI project aims only to uh, to uh, adapt these uh, plugins to uh, container use case uh, use cases. So I don't know if uh, it is useful it's to. It's actually a good point. Um, um, I did. Uh, I, I posted in the chat my my rewrite. I did put other resources. Uh, the reason it, it's worth uh, pointing out, uh, well, first of all, it's not for containers, it's for pods, right? The, the interfaces are shared by all containers within the yes. pod. Uh, but also there are interesting resources in Kubernetes that use CNI independently. Uh, so Kubevert mimics a pod. Well, it is a pod, but it's not a pod running containers. Vertlet does something entirely different. So. Um, you know, CNI is kind of the standard within the Kubernetes world that the internal resources in Kubelet use it, but also other extensions uh, adopt it as well. So, um, yeah. I think, I don't know uh, if I... and, 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 I'm, and I'm trying to avoid getting into the definition of Linux containers here as well, because right, in, right. in reality, all, all of these things, if it's configured the network namespace, you can make an argument that's running in some form of a Linux container with the process sitting in there, whether it's Kubert, Firecracker VM, GVisor, or so on. Uh, so you could say that it's actually being hosted in a, in a uh, something that looks like a container, like a Linux container. But, um, but for the sake of simplicity, because uh, I think maybe keeping the word container there uh, rather than just saying Linux container probably probably makes more sense because it, it won't uh, less likely to confuse people. And uh, by the way, Frederick, the point you raised about does it only create these interfaces or allow you to change them is a major flaw <laughs> in CNI, right? It's, it's an yeah. advantage well, is how simple it is, but it's, it's a problem it does not address directly at least. Yes, yeah, and CNI explicitly is an executable. So Kubernetes calls it, it runs, CNI exits, and the interface should exist. And it provides information back in a JSON format as to what uh, what's present. So this means that there's no long-term lifetime of the CNI plugin itself. So you could have something else like an SDN or similar, or keep the information and, and use it out of band. So it's so CNI itself because it's an executable has these significant limitations. And, um, well, I, I, it would be. I, I don't think the problem is that it's an executable because we, we have a concept in the network plumbing group we call a thick CNI plugin. So the, the executable can just be a client that runs. 
The problem is the definition of the interface itself and when it's called. It's called for creation. Um, what happens behind the scenes can be a long time running service, but uh, the problem is uh, it's not called again, <laughs> right, for changes, right? So the, the problem is the interface itself and how it's defined and how it's supposed to be used. I don't know if it's necessarily yeah. a problem, it's just not in the scope of what the CNI tries to do. So yeah, assuming that, that we're going to tackle CNI like gotchas later, what things does it do right now other than portability? How does it help us? Because um, I'd like Alok to be able to put this in. We'll have he kicked us off initially. Um, but I, like I said, it's, it's tough because I know we want to like go down these rabbit holes about like the things that leave us woefully underwhelmed with the CNI, but as far as the CNCF, you know, glossary context, what basic things does it do for us right now? And how does that make our life better? An another word I would add here is decoupling. It allows decoupling uh, network solutions from uh, uh, Kubernetes development. <laughs> I'm not sure I, um, I would phrase it. Yeah, it's, CNI itself is uh, also a uh, layer three um, as opposed to, to layer two, at least from the specification perspective. Of course, it's an executable. People can do whatever they want behind it, but the interface itself, the spec itself calls for, for layer three. So, uh, Frederick, do you know if IPAM is part of uh, the CNI specification? Yes, there is an IPAM portion attached to it, and IPAM okay. itself is a plugin. Yeah. So, so that's another important actual actually thing that it does. It manages addresses or allows for the management of addresses. You don't have to use but, it. But only pod IP addresses. Kubernetes itself manages services addresses. Correct. But, but within the context of what CNI does, right? When it creates those network interfaces, it uh, also allows for configuration of if you want to use whereabouts or something like that, it, it can let you uh, plug in uh, an address allocation management system. Correct, and and it returns to Kubernetes uh, DNS information as well to go into the to go into the uh, pod. So it doesn't actually the file system does not exist yet when CNI runs. So there's nowhere for it to actually drop drop a result.conf, but it does return DNS information, which can then be consumed, which which can then produce the right set of configurations for the container down the line. So you know what I would add to the uh, uh, first definition when we say creating network interfaces, we can say creating network interfaces and allocating IP addresses. Um, another thing as well that a lot of people don't realize is that CNI can be chained. So right. CNI is, is recursive. I think there are, there are two other aspects that we need to touch as well here. Uh, maybe it is very intrinsic and we don't have to talk about the network overlay network, the underlay network and the network policies. So do we want to mention any of those thoughts in here? Well, those aspects. Interestingly, in, interestingly, so th the network policies and, and similar are more of a Kubernetes construct than CNI. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is an area where the abstraction breaks down. So. Mm -hmm. The CNI itself doesn't actually call for any form of, of access Medic. control or, or similar, uh, mm. but you clearly need it in Kubernetes. Do we want to so, clearly say that out here? I, I think we should. We should say that Kubernetes itself applies additional requirements to the CNI plugin mm. in regards to network policy and uh, and service management because that, that that is a very important point it, kubernetes will break if you do not support at the very that, minimum uh services and it won't break if you don't if you don't provide policy but it, it's a but it's a significant detriment to a runtime environment if you don't have policy attached to it that's a that's a good call out
Is this true? Is the CNI? Well, yes, it is extensible in specific ways. That's true. I was say, have you seen some of the kludgy stuff that's come down the pipe? Um, but I, we, we can reword this. I'm just trying to capture some of the thoughts that I'm hearing in these discussions. Yeah, and, and to be clear from a wording perspective, so services is provided by, or even though it's provided by the CNI, it's not called, called for in the actual CNI spec itself. So it's an additional requirement that Kubernetes itself adds. This sentence is confusing actually, because what do I, how does it help with the service, right? The CNI itself doesn't do anything with the service. Yeah, I wouldn't call services a concept either. It's it's a specific resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey, for doing your best in capturing this chaos. Are we, trying to say that the CN, are we trying to say that a CNI instance is extensively on being updated or are we saying the CNI specifications? Both. So the, is, is I, the you know, is, do we know if, if CNI itself is the actual spec is being, uh, is being updated? Because that that's been very that's been stable for a for a very long time. So uh, historically, they they haven't added these additional features onto it. So uh, is is that just the additional Kubernetes requirements that are being added on, or is it uh, specifically are there specific changes occurring in CNI in the CNI spec itself that uh, that we should be aware of? I'm I think CNI itself has that. been very stable. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my I'm, understanding as well. I was so. thinking about this in the, the historical context, so it, it's probably not relevant at this point in time. At the beginning, though, they did, on the journey to stable, um, I feel like it was pretty flexible in getting it to where it needed to be, but then once they hit what they wanted, it definitely sort of completely ground to a halt. And obviously that standardization and you know, stable portability is its big selling feature, so. It's not something they want to mess with a whole bunch. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, from a historical side, uh, CNI was not originally designed for Kubernetes, but instead was designed for CoreOS and Fleet. And uh, they tried to put libnetwork in first, but there were some issues there. Uh, we'll go into it for uh, what happened in historical at this point, but uh, then so, so the actual CNI has been relatively well defined since then. It, I don't think it had chaining uh, within it. That was uh, the biggest change that they added on was uh, was chaining. But uh, it's been relatively stable since uh, 2016 ish, I think. I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. So we have the decoupling. It has um, facilitated the integration to things like Kubernetes. Um, I'm trying to find some way to capture in words this notion that if I am a network developer, as long as I build against the specification, I have a expectation that my stuff is just going to work, which we know isn't the case, but like, um, it's not like, you know, trying to think like the nearest example I have is like right before the CSI came about and like doing storage there for a while was a nut roll because everybody was doing it very, very differently. Um, I don't know the right way to capture this in words, but. I think you can just put a period here. Network developers are able to build against this specification. I think that tells you everything you need to know. 
Okay. Succinctness is not my strong suit, so it's helpful to have you guys reel me in. Um, okay, so this is a little weird, like problem it addresses versus how it helps. I could just drop this last sentence under the how it helps. I'd say that's helpful in my opinion. I mean, I know from the Kubernetes context, just management is a lot easier with the concept of like pod addressing being handled for you, um, things like that, but that's not CNI specific. I mean, it's something that the CNI helps you with in a specific implementation, but. Oh, um, another thing as well, and I, uh, and I don't know if this should fit into the wording or not, but uh, it, it doesn't, CNI itself doesn't even call for the creation of an interface. It's actually not interface uh, specific. So uh, one really good example of where this played out really, really early on was when we were talking about some of the Moltres stuff in 2016-ish, I think, uh, 2016, 2017 time period. The, uh, the uh, initial wording of it was, well, let's, yeah, the actual original name of the group was the multi-interface group. And the people from Calico pushed against it saying they had no intention of including additional interfaces to it. Uh, but instead they wanted to render the changes as uh, part of the same interface, so whether they're quality of service or, or similar. So uh, the CNI itself doesn't even call for a specific uh, addition of an interface. Uh, it primarily is, it deals with uh, that, IP, that IP connectivity. So a little bit of a, of a nuance. It may, it's one that we may not care about capturing here, uh, but it's when in the wording we should be careful to, uh, to not uh, mis misleaders as well. Well, we're specific about Kubernetes having adopted CNA, CNI for a purpose. So that's inside Kubernetes. Now extensions, other things that people do with CNI might not do that. <laughs> but Kubernetes itself, I, I think that sentence is correct, that Kubernetes has adopted CNI for creating network interfaces, allocating IP addresses for pods and other resources. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So that is the primary purpose. Like Kubernetes wants the network namespace to have an interface as part of the contract, which includes IP connectivity. And how you do that uh, is, is through CNI. Right, and, and that first sentence is true as well, that the CNI is a container specification for creating network plugins for containers. <laughs> that's open enough that you know it can allow for everything you just mentioned. Cool. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry about being pedantic here. I just I, I want to make sure that we're that we're careful. Keep in mind, this is just going to be a pull request too, so we don't have to knock it out of the park on our first swing. Um, hopefully, some other contributors in the CNCF glossary too will sprinkle their own commentary in here. Um, all right. I'm just going to go ahead and we should get uh, drop this in here for Tim Hawkins to. We should ask Tim Hawkins to take a look at the, the definition as well to see what he thinks. Is he in the CNA um, working group? Get just tag him in the comments. I uh, I don't right. know. I'm going to really quick then. Um, I think we have a good starting point. We can always circle back next Monday if we want to, or just put in a PR to the glossary and see how that goes. Um, I do want to give the last 15 minutes though to the glossary, which full disclosure, I am a little bit behind on since returning from my military obligations. So you guys will have to bear with me and kind of help lead this conversation on where we're at right now with this. And Is layer see, three? I, the statement about the layer three is all correct um, because it. Yeah. 
You talking about in the um, yeah this? in the just reply in the comments on what you think we need to um, okay sure I'll do that yeah. Um, so so Jeffrey uh, to to kind of go to that uh, PR about our glossary. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, we don't have too much time to discuss, but I, I wanted to make a meta comment maybe that um, I'm a little frustrated with how slowly everything is going. Um, uh, we've been discussing this PR for, for a while and I know I, I, I put a whole bunch of things here in the glossary and there was a lot to discuss, but I, I'd like to make a maybe general suggestion for the group. I know we're using GitHub and pull requests for, for collaborative work, a lot of advantages to that. But uh, look, guys, we're not, we're not, this isn't a source code for building. We're not breaking builds when we accept a PR. I know it's important to accept things that are good, but there might be some sort of limits to how much we can discuss everything, because this group can, can uh, wax philosophical about almost anything. That's, that's kind of what we do. I, I want to suggest that maybe we can move to a mode of, uh, you know, commit quickly, build quickly, you know, the, the open source model of, you know, move along quickly. So, you know, we can, we can accept PRs that might have issues, but then, you know, somebody can create another PR quickly that fixes those. Um, I, I think if we're, if we're gonna try to have every single line be absolutely perfect for everybody, I, I I just don't want us to waste so much time on on the individual PRs. I feel like we have a lot of work to do. And uh, I, I'm not trying to shove my PR through. <laughs> I'm not trying to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with all the discussions going on around this. Um, but then I, I, I'm not the right person to click resolve on a discussion. There, there's a lot of things in that discussion that are worth opening up to the group. Um, but we're tying the discussions to the PR as well in a way that just makes it really, really hard to get these PRs through. I, I don't know what people think about that. Hal, um, I appreciate the idea of trying to get things through quicker and iterative. I think some of the early stuff on all of this, um, including like the white papers was let's get stuff out and get discussions about it. So that's good. Uh, one thing that would help would be um, smaller PRs, specifically when there's discussion items. So this one isn't, this particular PR is one filled with discussions because it's the glossary. If it was a use case, then it's a lot different. We need definitions for what's talked about in a use case, but this is the global definitions that we want to agree to that we're expecting other people to say, yeah, that we agree and let's move forward. So anytime, this would be the same as code. If you're doing a, a massive code change for comments in code, then we just go, it looks good. Don't worry about it. But if, if it's doing something like changing um, how a storage driver and, and the kernel is working, and you say, I've refactored all of it, then it's gonna get blocked for a long time. And I would consider this the same thing from the standpoint of what we're trying to do is communicate with the Kubernetes community, Kubernate, uh, uh, communicate with all of the networking community. So we need to have this sort of thing broken down smaller. And going forward, I would suggest that for everyone else. Yeah, I would say, Cal, because this happened to me in my first attempt at the glossary. Um, I kind of changed my methodology. Even if you have a big write-up, I would just do each definition as its own PR. That way, if there's things that, you know, aren't going to have a war and peace discussion written about them, um, then we can just get them pushed. But like, this was what happened the first time I made a thing is I had like three or four definitions at once. I ended up like whacking the rest of them because, you know, there was three definitions that would have gone through with no issue, but then there was one that tied up the entire PR. So um, we've got this one here. I, I'm open to what the group thinks on. I mean, the simple thing, Tal, is just get five people to review it and accept it because then it meets the quota that we've set forth, right? Um, 
But I would say in the future, like this is just something I've learned and I think we're seeing it here is I would just break every single definition anytime it involves the glossary or something like that as it's each as its own PR, just so like you don't have like 80% of your stuff get hung up by like the 20% that everybody wants to pontificate about. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I'll try to do that in the future. Uh, a few of these glossary terms uh, speak to each other, so they might it might, might not have been a separate PR for each, but it could have been broken up into uh, a few PRs for sure. Uh, anyway, we, we are where we are with this. <laughs> I I, uh, I resolved a few conversations. I wonder if we can, we have some time we can go over what's remaining and see if uh, there are any more objections or desires to fix. Uh, I also went ahead and squashed all the commits. And um, so, so now everything is a single commit instead of uh, the mess it was before. So I, I think the, the big one might be about uh, PNFs. I think um, there are a few comments about how the PNF definition could be fixed. Um, if anybody would like to reword it right now, I'd be happy to do that. Jeffrey, can you bring up the view where it shows um, the, the other view where it just shows all the definitions? Might be easier uh, under files yeah. changes, file changes and right, right at the top, um, at the top. below the review, below changes, the review changes, changes, there's a code there's icon, a code and, icon a, and a, yep, and there you go. go. Yep, you had it rifted. Had it rifted. All right. All right. You said PNF, right? PNF, right? Yeah. I would uh, probably add that it's generally, um, uh, other than the API that it exposed, exposes, it's generally a black box to the uh, uh, to the consumers. Um, so we, we get no, is it always we, we, not if it's a white box, right? Like there's literally a PNF and they call it a white box just because it breaks that paradigm. Well, white box is still going over a specific type of thing. Like they're using Metcomp to, uh, to configure it. Do you have visibility into the actual like low level hardware details and similar, uh, through, through that? I, I suppose you, you do in, in that case. Yeah, this is kind of a nuanced thing, especially in the provider world. I would say people tell you they do, but typically it's them working with um, the BUs at the various vendors. Like if you look at something like, I don't know, like a Tofino chip or one of these third party ASICs that, you know, you can shift and lift resources to different things. I want more in this TCAM or something like that. Um, I would say you sort of do, but it, you know, if you're not the one writing like the embedded code yourself, you're kind of kidding yourself if you really think you are um, looking that deeply into it. But I, I don't think I don't think you could call it a black box, though, just because I think most vendors would complain about how those of us on the provider side demand that, like, their BU representative gets on a call and, like, unpacks every little secret because we want to know how it all works and drive them crazy. So, yeah, I feel black box is, Let's is keep a it judgment call. <laughs> Um, I use the word encapsulation and isolation, and um, to me, that's that's what it's about. Whether it's in a black box or an open box, black box is almost a derogatory term, isn't it? <laughs> Every vendor I would like their products. To, to be. <laughs> well, I, I I don't I don't tend to see it, but may, maybe others do, uh, because like if I I can create a a Linux system and I can say it's based on Red Hat. And all I do is give you a very specific interface to use it. You know how everything works inside of it, but your, your actual capability to use and affect it are entirely encapsulated by that API. So to you, it's a black box from a, from a usage perspective, despite the fact you know how all the internals work. So that, that, that was the mentality that I was thinking, but encapsulation that, that, does capture that. That, that. that as a point might be worth future 
documentation what when a black box and a white box is valuable but you know the reason we talk about things as black boxes is not because you don't have interest in how they're being constructed but if you're working with a vendor then if they tell you how it's constructed and then at some point they choose to change how it's constructed then they have to clear that with you which is really problematic whereas if it's just you don't know or care how it's constructed you just need to know it's working and here's the definition of working then that's a lot more simple to work with yeah so real quick because i want to stay on this pnf thing because we have five minutes left i actually to ian's point though this is the last i'll say it is i think it should be a best practice one of the things that i think went terribly wrong with mano was you know the se diagram showed a bunch of these like arbitrary boxes and then service providers thought that they could mix and match those arbitrary boxes which made the integration of the software a bear so um i think that that's a future discussion where we talk about like if you have a good interface maybe people should just consume it versus trying to reverse engineer it but as far as pnfs go though does anybody with the modifications that are in place now have any like we, burning questions we, or comments yeah, can we just simplify it that it is a basically it's an implementation with a tight coupling of hardware and software and make pnfs that well, I, I, my, my problem with that definition is that I think a lot of uh, CNFs and VNFs, you can say the same thing about them. Well, they um, wouldn't have, they, if they were a true CNF or a VNF, they wouldn't have a tight coupling of the software and hardware because you have a virtualization layer in between. Well, if there's a spectrum of coupling, it could be tight coupling and it can be loose coupling and it could be something in between. Yeah, um, but we, we're talking of, uh, we have, or, or we can say that the software implementation is highly dependent on the underlying hardware. I, to me, the main issue is that it's discrete. That is, it is separate. Uh, the PNF is a box that is not part of your cluster. It's not part of your, your cloud. How it's built internally, I think, is beside the point almost of the, the definition of the PNF, right? If it's open, if it's closed, if it uh, allows you to install things, the point is that it's not part of your cloud. I think, I think for the kind of discussions that we have in the CNF working group, that is the defining feature in my view. So when you're discussing in that manner, you're discussing about the software, but a PNF could be part of the cloud infrastructure. It could be part of the underlying infrastructure that you have. Okay, if, it, right. if it's a discrete box, if it's a discrete box, if a PNF is a software element, which is highly dependent on some hardware, then it's slightly different. To be honest, uh, it's Dan from Bell. I, the previous definition that Tal did, I think, is actually the right good enough one because um and i think ian said as the same thing is how it's wired underneath whether it's using all kind of open principles and open interfaces the fact that you don't and uh, ian actually explained it pretty well you don't you should not care and you don't really under have a say on whether the vendor decides to change from a specific specific API to go from the control plane to the ASIC or something else. It's just you get you get a, 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 a isolated box that you plug into your network. Yeah, I think I'm personally good with this definition. I think the key word here that Tal put in is discrete. And that's really what kind of makes it different, you know, because you can couple um, CNFs, VNFs, whatever. But like the con like the main notion in my mind and this is sort of what um, I, someone else was saying, was um, the fact that it's discrete means that this software is designed for this hardware versus you know the VNF and the CNF are trying to break that paradigm. I actually like that this one is kind of yeah. short and sweet, but still kind of gets the message across in my opinion. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'll, like I will add it. Yeah, sorry, Frederick. I was saying I like I'm liking this definition more and more. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I, I do. You know, the, the discussion here is very interesting. The the issue of black boxes and just how discrete things are, and with regards to Mano, is an important one that I think we'll have to 
continue to discuss because this black box idea is not just, we don't just see it in PNFs, we see it in the Etsy approach to network functions generally. Every network function to an extent, if you look at the Mano architecture is like a black box. And the yeah. point is that you supposedly chain together these black boxes into a network surface. But as I keep saying, this, uh, this very strong separation between network functions and network services, I'm not sure it always serves us well. <laughs> I don't think it ever existed for what it's worth, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to define a black box, you've got to be very clear about what the outside of the box looks like. And I think that was the problem, right? right. It isn't right. that it's a black box that's a problem. It was that it was an ill-defined black box that was the problem. Anyway, um, kind of, again, secondary to the PNF conversation. I have to drop, friends. Um, I'm going to look at the rest of this PR, but yeah. I think what we have here for PNF is good in my book. Um, I'm happy with this. So I will look over the rest, take a peek at um, Taylor's recent thing. I kind of agree with him that Cloudified is kind of wonky. So um, I'll kind of work asynchronously with the group here. Have a great week, everyone, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.